Hello, uh, fans of Ann Arbor District Library. Um, I have this amazing opportunity to uh, read again uh, All American Boys by Jason Reynolds and Brendan Kiley for the Washtenaw Reads uh, program. And um, this book is really amazing to me as an author. It does um, a lot of things that I want books to do. It lays out a, a very clear and simple story uh, in a direct and not confusing manner. But underneath that is a world of complexity that encompasses um, race and the history of racism and and <laughs> our country's history of racism is the underpinning of this book. Family dynamics and race are the underpinnings of this book. Friendships and race, school dynamics and race, team dynamics and race. And uh, you could do undergrad and graduate school, get your master's and PhD um, using these uh 250 pages um it doesn't matter how many pages but i'm using these 300 pages as your as your jumping off point and um it, it's what's amazing about this book but it's also what's amazing about a lot of ya and especially a lot of ya now and the authors who are who are writing these compelling and dynamic stories um quite a few of which in the, in the last few years um, have dealt with uh, the relationship between the police and communities of color and, and specifically pre police brutality. So uh, there's another video that, that, that sets up the early chapters of this book, but I'll just reframe it real quick, um, reiterate what's happened in the story so far. Um, in the story, um, Jason Reynolds... Um, narrates, uh, writes Rashad's narration of his story and his experience as the victim of police brutality. And Brendan Kiley writes Quinn's experience as a witness to the event that, um, that puts this story in motion. Um, we learn about Rashad's friends in the opening chapter and Quinn's friends and how there's an intersection there um, in terms of uh, not Quinn's friends, but his basketball um, basketball team. We learn that there's an, there's a, a Venn diagram. There's a connection there. They don't know each other, but they're, but they're connected through their friends and through the basketball team. Rashad isn't on the basketball team. He's an artist kid. He's um, an, uh, an, he's a member of the ROTC um, the Reserve Officers Training Corps, I think. So he's been compelled by his very strict father to um, to do this one thing. He's appeasing his dad by doing this one thing. Yes, I'll be in ROTC. Um, so he's he's a straight laced kid. Not that he doesn't like to have fun and party. We learn he does, um, but but he's a good kid that doesn't get into trouble. Um, so he and Quinn are both. Uh, on their way to the same party, um, Rashad goes into Jerry's convenience store to get some chips. Um, there's a misinterpreted situation where he he trips over a woman or she trips over him, whatever happens. Um, there's these chips on the floor, there's an open duffel bag, and there's a cop and a store owner right there to accuse Rashad of theft and without being given an opportunity to explain the situation, Rashad is brutally beaten by a police officer, Paul. So the complexity uh, comes right at us real fast in that Quinn witnesses this beating and realizes that the police officer doing the beating 
is his best friend's big brother. Not only is Paul uh, the best friend's big brother, but he was also Quinn's mentor after his own father, who'd been uh, a veteran, um, after his own father had passed away. So there's um, a direct connection between Quinn, the witness, and the police officer. And I think bearing witness is a theme that is so strong in this book. And um, we'll, we'll talk about this in the coming videos, but that theme of bearing witness, uh, we are all bearing witness. Um, we see the videos and uh, Quinn bears a responsibility. He's a witness, and so he's responsible. And I think it's impossible for me to read this book without taking that lens into account. In this book, we've seen, uh, we've seen Rashad being beaten, and we can't help but reflect on seeing the beatings and murders and deaths um, on the news all the time and the question is what is Quinn going to do with this information and the question for me is what am I going to do with this information so um, there's a lot more that happens in terms of Quinn's response and his response to his friends but Quinn is freaked out he feels in his gut that Paul went way too far that he went way overboard um, he feels the same thing R Rashad felt that Paul the police officer um, was reacting in a way that was 100% unjustified and that throws Quinn into a in, into a deep state of confusion and um, and that beating throws Rashad into the hospital arrested uh, he's taken into into the hospital in police custody in handcuffs um, and the the chapters are told um, Friday the first chapter is um, Rashad the second chapter is Quinn and then Saturday uh, the first chapter is Rashad so I'm going to talk about the Saturday chapter Saturday morning Rashad wakes up in the hospital um, he's in a state of confusion uh, he's not quite remembering what happened and why he's there and what he what situation he could have been involved with to get him beaten up um, and put in the hospital and he quickly remembers his mom comes to his aid his mom is there his loving amazing <laughs> mother is feeling for him and um, and the only response we get right off the bat from mom is just this loving caring for her son she wants him to be okay and um, that brings us to dad coming into the picture and things getting complicated real quick and I do want to read a little bit of this um, Rashad he said my name the same way he said it every other day when he was waking me up for school as if nothing was wrong as if he wasn't broken up by the side of me lying in bed black and blue and taped and bandaged and tubed and connected to machines monitoring whether or not I was actually still breathing mmm I grunted help me out here son he said in his normal voice which was his asshole voice I need to know why the hell I need to know what the hell you were thinking shoplifting shoplifting and from Jerry's of all places dad had that disappointed look on his face the same face he used to give me before I joined ROTC the same face he made whenever he talked about Spoonie Spoonie we've learned is Rashad's brother I didn't steal nothing I said suddenly feeling too tired to explain even though I just woke up well then why did the cops say you did dad replied narrowing his eyes and taking a sip of his coffee a slurp 
I don't know. You don't know, Dad scoffed. Really, Rashad. You don't know? I felt a cough coming on and did everything I could to pinch it back, knowing that if I let it out, my entire body would feel like it was being hit by a million tiny hammers on the inside. I managed to get it down to a single closed-mouthed grunt, and guess what? It didn't matter. Every bone still seemed to tremble, and my head suddenly felt full of helium. No, I don't know, I repeated after getting through the cough. So I, I just want to go back and read a little bit more. So walk me through this, son. You go to the store. I go to the store just to get gum and chips. I pick the bag of chips I wanted. So he explains what happened. And uh, this is the dad's response. Were your pants sagging? Dad interrogated now over by the door. Were my pants sagging? I repeated, shocked by the question. What does that have to do with anything? Oh, it matters. If it walks like a duck and it talks like a duck. My mother glared at him. David, this is your son we're talking about. The boy has never even been suspended. But they don't know that, Dad said. What they see is what he presents. And it sounds like he presented himself as just another... Another what? Ma cut in again. So... I just wanted to talk about the dad because immediately you just don't like the dad. You don't, you don't like the dad. He calls his, he says his own dad treats him, uh, talks to him like an asshole. So, um, this response from the dad kind of victim blaming is, I just have a knee jerk response to that. But then there's another side of me, the reader side, the writer side, the dad side that says, hey, let's take a look at this situation from the dad's perspective. And that leads me to these questions like, what is there in his personal history to make him respond this way? Okay, there's this assumption that I am going to have as much as the dad comes across as mean as a jerk. I'm going to say that what he wants is safety for his sons. He wants security for his sons. He doesn't want his sons to die. He doesn't want his sons to be beaten up. He wants the best for his sons. So I'm going to give him I'm going to give him that benefit of the doubt. So what in his personal history might teach him that looking conservative, dressing conservative, being quiet, disappearing not causing trouble, joining ROTC and wearing a blue uniform, um, what in all that might make, uh, might make his son safer and more secure? What in, what in the history of his family, in the history of our country, um, might tell the dad that walking that straight and narrow path gives you a better chance at safety and security? Um, so... When I delve into those questions, it doesn't make me like the dad a lot more, but it, it makes me understand the dad. And I know as a dad, I know I'm probably speaking to a lot of teens who've read this book out there, but I'm going to look at it as a dad for a second and say that there are times when looking out for my little boy's safety and security... I'm a dad of two boys, just like just like the dad in this story. In looking out for their safety and security, I've been that asshole dad. I've been that dad who yells. I've been that dad who, who didn't come across as nice. Because in that moment, I just wanted my kids to be safe. So, um, so who comes into the picture next? But it, it is Spoonie. Spoonie, um, he's described as having... Uh, his hair is not conservative. He's, he's, his pants are the sagging pants. He's a loud presence and he comes into this story loud and he is, he's not going to be quiet. He's not going to be conservative. He's not going to give in. And, um, and it just like begs this question, which, which path there there are always more than two paths but there's this dichotomy set up of the secure safe be quiet be invisible path that the dad is is encouraging and the be loud and fight path 
this other path hasn't worked. We're here. We're in this place and we have to fight. This is Spoonie's path. And, um, and, uh, which way are things going to go in this story? Whose path is Rashad going to take? And, uh, whose path is mom going to take too? Um, I just wanted to read in response to that idea of these two different paths. Um, I just wanted to read about Rashad here. I got, or from Rashad's perspective, I got to admit, there was a part of me that even though I felt abused, I wanted to tell him to let it go, to just let me heal. Let me leave the hospital. Let me go to court. Let me do whatever stupid community service they would want me to do and let me go back to normal. I mean, I'd seen this happen so many times, not personally, but on TV, in the news, people getting beaten and sometimes killed by the cops. And then there's all this fuss about it only to build up to a big heartbreak when nothing happens. The cops get off and everybody cries and waits for the next dead kid to do it all over again. That's the way the story goes. A different kind of Lifetime movie. I didn't want all that. Didn't need it. So what fascinates me about that moment is... Um, is that Rashad is the witness too. He he's he's the kid in the hospital bed with broken ribs and internal bleeding and a nose that's gonna be screwed up forever. But he's talking about being being the witness too and and seeing this happen so many times before and, and having nothing change. And 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 for this moment he's like I just I just wanna be me. I don't wanna be an issue person. I don't want to be the crux of this situation. I just want it to go away. And um, on some level, as much as so many of us want things to change, as much as we want things to improve, as much as we want to go to rallies or hold our signs or hashtag or Facebook, uh, Instagram, <laughs> Twitter, as much as we involve ourselves in that, there is this piece, I think, in many of us and um and this piece bears analysis for each of us personally and um and i'm no different i need to analyze myself in this way but but there is this piece in us i'll speak for myself there is this piece in me i think to be perfectly honest that um as angry as i can get up about all this there is relief that comes when there's a sense that the cycle ends and and it's um, a part of white privilege to take that moment to say, oh, it's, it's, it's over for now. Um, I'm not going to think about that for, for a few days. When um, in other communities, communities of color, the black community, there isn't that moment of release. There isn't that... I, things are back to normal. Rashad wants it, but it, but it just it, it won't ever totally come um, uh, until there's major major change. So um, so that's Saturday from Rashad's perspective. That's where I am uh, in this mind blowing book, and um, and we will see you in another video uh, in a later chapter of All American Boys by. Jason Reynolds and Brendan Kiley.